Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Guest today, Tom Chatham. Tom, I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for coming on. And tell us where you're calling in from, first of all, and uh, what you do for a living at uh, your company, Chatham. Yeah, I'm I'm in Half Moon Bay, California. It's a little town about 25 miles south of San Francisco. Awesome. I was born and raised there. So was my father. Uh, and that's where our business began with my father. He was a genius at chemistry and he was the first man in the world to ever commercially produce an emerald in a laboratory. And that was back in 1935. And he'd made that his life's work. And he did that at a very young age too. I joined him in 1965 after college and I was nowhere near as gifted as he was, but I had other qualities that he lacked and that was in marketing. And that's what I went into. And that's where I've taken the company over the last 58, 59 years. So we've, the Emerald was the first, and then we created one of the first rubies and then many colors of sapphires and alexandrite, which is a crystal barrel, color change stone. And now we're growing diamonds in colors and white. We sell strictly wholesale into the industry, primarily in the U.S. We kind of gave up on the international marketplace. Mm -hmm. It's just too hard to understand what the marketplace needs. And, you know, the U.S. is more than big enough. So that's what we what, what we aim at. Yeah, it's fair enough. So obviously your background is directly with this, working with this kind of chemistry, working with these types of gemstones. What did you kind of bring to the table when you took over or, you know, what did you bring to the table when, uh, you know, took it, taken over for your father? What did you try to do differently in those years to do a little things a little bit differently on the marketing front than maybe what your father was doing on his own? Well, there was no overnight, you know, I think we ought to do this, dad. But he was very open to ideas. He excelled at chemistry, but he didn't excel at business and marketing. And when I joined him after he'd been in business for many years, he had developed a market. One person in the world bought everything we made. And when I came in, I said, Dad, this doesn't feel good. This is dangerous. You know, what if something happens to them? And of course, they don't share information with us as far as where they're selling, how they sell it. We didn't even know the prices. And it was a little embarrassing, to tell you the truth. So I kept, you know, kind of being a pain in the ass to my father. I said, you know, we ought to know this. We ought to be able to do this. We should know what's happening with our product. And because of the type of product that it is, it's identical to natural, and we don't want it sold as natural, which is very easy to do around mm -hmm. the world. So we want to stay on top of the advertising, and we weren't able to do that, being a third-party situation. So I slowly drifted into this marketing position. It took uh, at least 10 years to uh, get him to come around and think my way, or just let me do what I wanted to do. I was lucky at that, too. He didn't, if he didn't really know what to do, and I came up with a suggestion, he said, okay, Okay, go run with it, you know? So uh, we slowly eased away from this person we were selling to, much to their discontent. And uh, I mean, it, it got so bad, they offered me bribes on the side. Tom, you're really upsetting wow. the apple cart. Right? And I said, mm -hmm. you made a very, you know, foolish mistake. I'm not going to sell out my father, you know? And that was about the end of his relationship with us. So we had to reinvent what we already were. I mean, my father had a lot of exposure with free advertising. You know, we were on TV programs, or he was. A lot of newspaper articles, a lot of periodicals would write stories about this man who can grow emerald. And that being the first and being in the U.S., it helped a lot. We didn't have a competitor until about 1960. And that was coming out of France. And it was a good product. And whenever somebody came out with a product that was similar to ours, we always went to meet him, invited him. And we said, you know... We don't want a thousand competitors, but every stone we sold before that competitor came in, we had to advertise to sell and it's expensive. So having other people advertising and spreading the word expanded the marketplace. And we probably in one in, in the colored stone category right now, we only have maybe four or five competitors in the world. In the diamond side of it, we've got thousands of competitors that are growing diamond and it's a real headache. But that's what happens when they don't keep a secret. I mean, our process, yeah. our secret. And to this day, after 80 years, no one knows what we do. And that's because we don't let you in. And if you come to me for a job, and I've had this conversation in the last two weeks with a PhD chemist from Stanford trying to find work. And I said, I'm sorry, you can't come in, into the offices even. We don't hire people like you. And he was pretty insulted. And I said, you know, don't take it personally, but I got enough employees for life. 
And that's what happens. So we hire people without that kind of education and specifically without a chemistry background. I mean, we don't hire the village idiots, but just regular people. And then we compartmentalize what they know and what they're exposed, the names of the chemicals we use, things like that. My father actually had dead drops or whatever you want to call them, fake addresses to ship stuff to that were receiving the chemicals just so people wouldn't catch on to what we were doing. So you have to be careful. Yeah. No. And so you kind of would hire like non-classically trained chemists and kind of teach them the process to be able to synthesize what you're doing without them necessarily knowing and having the potential capacity to you know spread the word about how the process really works and like all the intricacies, just kind of know like step one, to 10, now you're done, could kind of feel? Yeah. Uh, what I've told my competitors is that everybody has a price, and that's what's happened. Yep. It happened to uh, Mikimoto. He kept that out of culture pearl secret for over 100 years until somebody got to one of the workers and found out how easy it was to culture a pearl. And unfortunately, that person came from China and they totally saturated the market with their pearl, and the prices just fell apart. And that's happening right now with diamonds. Right. Uh, exactly. There are 7,000 diamond growers in India and about 6,000 in China. And it's a great product, but being ruined today. Yeah, but I was, I was going to ask you this question too. I mean, I guess on the on the side of colored gems, it seems to be still pretty rare. And, you know, it's, it, the prices seem to still be pretty, you know, premium for those products. Cause, and that what you just told me that makes sense is that not, still not, not, not that many people are doing it. Well, how was kind of your experience? I mean, when you got started in, you know, what, what I assume just based off the timeline was kind of in the maybe like 80s, 90s. How have you kind of experienced this move from like this very new and novel idea of synthesizing gems? stones that are like basically indecipherable to this kind of like air of I don't know what to call it like I guess it's like an air of superiority with natural grown rather than uh, like synthesized diamonds you could see it like kind of like price wise on the diamond market especially just because it's more flooded but have you kind of experienced that like public perception of lab grown gemstones and diamonds over time maybe then how it's differently different today than maybe it was when you when you first started it was such a novel process that was probably the biggest hurdle my father had was getting people to understand the chemistry of what he was doing and difficult Today, it's difficult. And if you don't have a chemistry background, we don't really blame you for not being able to understand it. We seem to accept biological types of growth, flowers, what have you, and even pearl. But that's a, a more of an organic type of growth process. And we seem to accept that hot house flowers. I mean, it's exactly what we're doing. We're setting up an environment in which nature will make the atomic structure of the compound we're trying to grow. And if we don't copy those environments correctly, we don't get what we're after. So yeah, I guess, it's, sorry, it's been a long, slow process of education, luckily with a lot of free advertising through the interest groups. I mean, like National Geographic, Reader's Digest, those kinds of platforms are invaluable. Some some of them are impossible to buy. So. Yeah, it's fascinating. And obviously, you know, you kind of coming from a more marketing background, have you kind of noticed your strategy change over time at the advent of obviously this wild side of digital marketing that's like almost everything today? And also, have you moved away from doing 100% wholesale as well? And do you do any direct to consumer selling these days? Or are you kind of kept with that uh, tradition of doing only wholesale? No, I mean, it, we stick strictly to wholesale. It, I mean, there's no law against being a retailer. But right. if I sell retail, why would a retailer buy from me? Because I compete with them. And we had this happen to us as we expanded vertically in our organization from selling loose cut stones to manufacturers that made jewelry. And then I started to make jewelry and they became upset that they were competing with me. Even though we had different customers, we had different stylings. It was just the nature of the beast. It's not why, you know, we're competing with you. You can undersell it if you wanted to. And I didn't, but it did affect our relationships and we no longer sell the manufacturers because of that. But we now are very successful selling finished jewelry to the retail trade, independent jewelry stores and chain. Mm -hmm. No, that definitely makes sense. And I know you mentioned this earlier. How do you kind of deal with and make sure like what processes do you have in place to ensure that these lab grown gemstones that you're selling are not being advertised as real, even though they, they are completely basically indecipherable? I'm sure there is ways. I'm sure they don't know what they are. But how do you kind of keep tabs on those things and make sure that the you know quality control is there and nothing is being pawned off as maybe natural or non lab grown that way? I think we've done a couple of things. Over the years, we have donated thousands of stones to the major labs around the world so they can do their homework 
and then they can teach people how to separate. I mean, different mines and natural stones. You can tell where it comes from if you do the, your homework and study the, the indications of where that stone grew. And it doesn't matter if it grew in Colombia or it grew in San Francisco. There's going to be some telltale indication of origin in the stone. Not all of the stones, but, but in many of them. And so that started it as far as getting the trade to be educated gemologically. The other thing is if a retailer takes advantage advantage of somebody, which they can easily do, if they get caught, which they probably will get caught, it's not worth, you know, the trouble. I mean, you're going to get into. And thirdly, the Federal Trade Commission watches over this stuff and they watch over us. They watch over our advertising. I mean, we've gone to court with the FTC before. We won, prevailed because the natural people wanted us to call our stone synthetic and we refused. And it was a three-year court battle. We won. So you won't see it in anything coming from us saying synthetic. And the reason is that gemologically speaking, we fit the definition of a synthetic stone. But in other fields, there's so many things that are called synthetic, like oil, which has no chemical resemblance to natural oil, synthetic rubber, which doesn't resemble natural rubber, nylon. And there's a thousand different examples of the confusion that's out there. So the FTC has actually come out and said, you know what, let's just avoid the word and let's not say it's right or wrong. We're just going to say it's confusing. So do you use something else. So there's a host of other words that are allowed. And that's where creative came from. Chatham created Emerald. It's really fascinating. I mean, obviously it fits the bill, maybe even the definition of synthetic, but I mean, the way that it's used in popular sentiment is like not always super clear to begin with, but also most of the time when you use synthetic, it doesn't even mean that it's exactly the same. It means it's altogether different. So it definitely makes sense. And uh, one question I always love to ask everybody that comes on the podcast, especially if somebody has been in business as long as you have is, I suppose, you know, you got really involved, maybe even at a time where you really took over the business entirely. If you could go back at any point, I suppose, and just give yourself any one piece of advice if you were to like, you know, start and like you continue to grow this business again. What do you think that piece of advice would be? I think the one word that would cover it is persistence in what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I went all around the world trying to find people that could facet our stone. And obviously I went to cutting centers that faceted natural stone. And in some of them, I wasn't well received either, but I needed their capabilities and their talents. And I uh, was successful over many years in getting these people to understand that the uh, inconsistencies of natural natural gemstone cutting can be made up for with a product like ours that cuts just like the natural, but I am producing a consistent supply and I can keep a big factory running, which I do now. I got 300 people in China. That would be very rare in the natural gem business. So it, and I, it, persistence of direction, and it sounds easy to say it now, knowing where I've been, but I didn't know where I was going. I just had a vision that I think we ought to do this. And again, luckily my father didn't stand in my way. He said, you want to fly halfway around the world and find out some of these people, go ahead. And I spent half my life in an airplane. So much so my kids didn't want to be in the business. They said, nah, no thanks. Did they ever come around or are they still removed? I have one daughter. I have three kids, two girls and a boy. My son got fired by my brother because he, he thought he, I don't know, was bulletproof because he was the boss's son. And I warned all of them. I said, don't pull that, you know, I'm the boss's daughter or son routine because they don't like you anyway, other employees. So you have to be better than they are. You have to show up earlier. You know, that kind of thing. So son got fired. One daughter, she wasn't really into it and ran off and joined the army and was in the army for, or not the army, uh, the air force for 28, 29 years and just retired as a master sergeant. Oh, she wow. did very well. And another daughter has been with me for 35 years and she's in sales, but she told me 20, 25 years ago, she said, I do not want to take this business over. So I'll be glad to work for you. Very happy at that, but just don't consider me as being groomed to take it over. Right. So, right. That's amazing. And I, I love that answer, by the way, because as I mentioned before, before we got started here today, I, I just lo I love finding commonality between different types of entrepreneurs, whether you're pre-revenue or been in business as long as you have. It's part of the answer almost 100% of the time when I ask, which is, well, I had no idea what I was doing at the beginning and like things I would do differently to tackle that like lack of you know experience, basically. I mean, you know, I, had a, I had somebody on the podcast last week, you'll see his podcast go live probably in the next week or so. And he was a software developer at a big video game studio for 30 something years. And then he somehow got roped into selling cashmere sweaters to celebrities through some like mutual connection that he had and he thought it was just going to be you know something you know that he could figure out i mean he ran businesses before but the same thing i mean he was in business for 30 35 years in an entirely different field and he got into this he said i had no idea what it took to run a business from the marketing to the operations to just how much time everything takes with the growth and the product development and everything i love that you obviously you know with your 60 years of experience still kind of like find some of that you know common sentiment when you got started even though your father was there to obviously show you the ropes and he was a master chemist you're still getting into that side of things and taking the business into your own hands there's always 
a point, it seems, with an entrepreneur, no matter what you're doing or how much expertise you have. And the part of running the business, you're going to feel like you know nothing at some point. So, but I think the, the advice is well taken that, you know, you've spent a lot of time, you know, going around the world, learning from the best people, edu- and doing some education for them as well is another common, you know, answer I get to that, which is just, you know, don't try to do everything yourself. Don't think you know everything. Don't try to learn even everything yourself through what you can find. Like you have to go out there. People are willing to help. People are willing to talk and just learn from people no matter what it takes. So I definitely appreciate that advice for anybody listening who's maybe, you know, getting into a capital venture for the first time or just becoming an entrepreneur for the first time. Anecdotal answers after the 75th time, it's not so anecdotal anymore. So I appreciate your perspective on that as well. And yeah, Tom, I just want to give you a quick opportunity as well, just to shout out, you know, your website, anybody listening might be potentially interested in partnering with you or just, you know, staying in touch or uh, learning a little bit more about your business. What's the best way to stay in touch with you all? We have a website. It's mm-hmm. a, a lot of information on there. It's chatham.com and uh, all the products that we sell, we show to the consumers. We will direct them to retailers that have the product. There's a lot of historical information. There's, I wrote a book that's available to anyone, of course, on the website. And uh, it's more information than sales pitch. That's where you can find it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tom, I just want to say thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate your wealth of knowledge and just want to wish you the best of luck and continued success in what you're doing. I know, uh, I think I mentioned right before, it seems like you're coming up on your 60th anniversary of being uh, the CEO of this business. So congratulations on that. It's an amazing accomplishment. So yeah, just want to say thank you again for coming on and I really look forward to uh, staying in touch. You're welcome. My Thanks, pleasure. Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody.